So we have the looking at the differential differential formula for arc length. So we're going to start with a continuous function. So suppose y equals f of x. I want this to be continuous and also the derivative. And suppose they're continuous on the interval a to b. So by fundamental theorem of calculus, this function that I'm going to write down which is s of x is the integral from a to x square root 1 plus f prime t squared dt. So what in the world is this function? The inside part right here is the arc length from some number a up to some number x. So the difference between this and what we wrote down before, this is using what we call a dummy parameter, a dummy variable, which is the t variable. So once you find this antiderivative, you will no longer have the t variable anymore because you'll be plugging in the number a and then the variable x. So t won't appear anymore. This will be a function of x. Now what does this function of x represent? So let's say you don't want to go all the way to b. You just want to go from a part way to b. How far to b? We'll stop at the number x. So you can stop wherever you want along the way, and this will tell you how far you've gone. So whereas the other one went from a all the way to b, this one can stop anywhere in between. So this is the length along the curve, y equals f of x from, if we're at as a point, it'll look like a comma f of a to x comma f of x. So you get to stop at whatever uh, x value you want. So we'll do one example, find the differential formula for arc length, or we can just write uh, s of x for y equals x cubed over 12 plus 1 over x, starting at, all right, this is a point, so we're going to start here and then we'll go um, go up to x. <clears throat> what would be a x value that this original curve is definitely not continuous for? What x value should I watch out for? First term, I can plug in any x value I want, no problem. So better not plug in zero. So just looking at what's going on, if we're going to start at x equals to one, I want to not make sure I don't go across zero. So what I write down is going to be valid for x, for any x between 0 and infinity, but cannot equal 0. So this will work for any x between 0 and infinity. Why did I put infinity here instead of a big number like 100? Because this will work going past 100. You can go to 1,000, 10,000, whatever number you're thinking of we can go past that number. So you just write infinity to represent the fact you can go as far as you want that direction. I can't go past, I can't go to zero, and because of that I can't go past zero the other way. So that's why it cuts off right there. So all we need to do is use this formula right here. So I need to know, let's rewrite this as a f of x. So f of x is x cubed over 12 plus 1 over x. I'm actually going to need f of t, so I'll just replace everything by a t. That's not hard to do. Just got t cubed. 
over 12 plus 1 over t. So I need a few things. I need f prime of t, and then I need 1 plus f, 1 plus f prime of t squared. This is the same function as before, though. So I can use my calculations from before. So I could recompute all this stuff, or I can just scroll up and see what I got last time. So let's go up and make sure we get the right example. This is the x cubed over 12 plus 1 over x. That is, here we go. The parts I'm going to take. That's what we started with, and somewhere, actually look, we'll just take this right here. The only difference is we have where you see x, we're going to have t. So we don't need to redo all this work. So we get t squared over 4 plus 1 over t squared squared. So you can go through all the same steps that we did before, but I'm just going to shortcut right down to there. So that is as simple as we can get, and we'll just rewrite s of x, integral a to x, 1 plus f prime, prime t squared dt is the integral what is our a value? Uh, one. A value is 1. So it's going to be the x value you're starting at. So this is the thing that's underlined right there. So initial x value is 1. We don't have a final x value. We're just going to sum uh, some number x. And I'm going to write the simplified version and go ahead and take the square root at the same time squared over 4 plus 1 over t squared. So squaring cancels the square root that I would get. And let's go ahead. I didn't really do any of the calculus for this problem, so we'll go ahead and finish this problem off. So we got t squared over 4. Antiderivative is t cubed over 12. Minus 1 over t from 1 to x. Now this one looks a lot like the original function. That was coincidence, because it kind of had a derivative. And then when you squared it, it had its weird factoring. They won't generally look just like the original. So that's coincidence on this one. If I plug in which x value should I get 0, you can see it right here. What x value, when I plug it in, better give me 0? And you don't even need to know what's in here, regardless of what I just crossed out. 1. So let's integral from 1 to 1 of any function. 0. So let's just make sure that works down here in our final answer. So we should get s of 1 to be 0, just checking it. 
1 over 12 minus 1 over 1 plus 11 over 12 does add up to 0. So it doesn't mean we're correct, it's just one fast thing I can check real quick. So it's not part of the original problem, I was just checking, making sure at least that one value that I can super easily check works out. If I did the original problem all the way, I'm pretty sure I stopped, so I didn't feel like finishing it off. This, I would get a, the arc length from 1 to 4. I could then plug in 4 on the one I just found, and then better get the same number you get right here. So that'll be another point I can check. So that is the end of arc length. So what we're going to do next is service areas. And service area is very much related to arc length. And we're going to look at services of revolution. So it's basically the exact same thing as the geometry is the same as the uh, solid of revolution. The only thing we're going to be doing is not looking at volume. We're going to look at the area that that surface has revolved into. So you know, drawing things out will be exactly the same. Just your cross sections are going to look different. We're not trying to revolve sections into solids. So we're going to look at cross sections in a slightly different way. So this basically combines together what we did at the beginning of chapter 6 with our last section. So let's do a real fast review of what we did before. So before we took a basically a rectangle and then revolved it. So this was 6.1 way back in the day. We revolved that and we got a disk. That's a pretty bad drawing, but that's okay. So you revolve it and you get a disk. So I'm not really interested in measuring, taking the measurements of this disk. Uh, we did all that. I just wanted to relate what we did before to what we're about to do now. So disk and <coughs> What I want now is to, and I might as well draw this whole solid out. So that was to get the volume. Now we're going to look for a service area. And we go for the service area. We're not going to count the boundaries right there. We're just going to get the service area that was caused by that revolution right there. If I did want to get these two areas, the two service areas of the boundaries right here, what shape would they be? Circles. Circles, and how do you get the area of a circle? Pi r squared. So you just got to know one radius, get that area, know the other radius, get that area. It's not really a calculus problem. So I'm not going to worry about getting these two areas at the end. Uh, and some shapes, if they go and touch the rotation axis, that would mean there's no actual uh, flat circular edge on that end. So if it comes down to a point, you don't get that. The area is just counted in the integral. So let's think about measuring the surface area now. So one thing, I don't really care about the inside part of this anymore. So let's just start, get rid of that inside part. So what I'll do is redraw, because you can't erase so easily. So I'll redraw our curve. I'll go with the blue here. So with arc length, we broke our curve into straight, small, straight line segments. So we cut up into a bunch of small pieces. Let's think about cutting this up into small pieces. So just like before, we're going to make a whole bunch of little tiny segments going across. <laughs> and what we're going to do with those segments is obviously revolve them and see what they revolve into. So this is now our cross section. That's not really the best word. This is our little subdivision right here. So this is a small line segment. 
And now let's go and revolve it. When we revolve it, is this going to be a just revolving that blue line segment, just a line segment, is this going to be hollow or is this going to be solid? So we only rotated that little blue line segment. This will be a hollow shape. So we didn't rotate all that stuff underneath it. So we're going to get just a, a hollow shape. And what we want to do is get the surface area. And the shape's hollow, so I'm just going to write find the area. All right, find the parentheses surface area. So if these line segments are going to be cut up into pieces. We obviously are going to cut them into smaller and smaller pieces. And we call this amount right here dx. That's the amount we're going to go over. Now if dx is really small, the amount you would actually go, so if we zoom in really close here, there's two issues. that we're going to run into. One of them is the line segment won't have the exact curve that the curve will have. So there'll be some bendiness. But by repeated subdivisions, by making the line segment smaller and smaller, that problem will disappear. There is another problem that no matter how, how small I cut this up into, this line segment won't really get any flatter. Even if I cut this into, especially if you focus on this section right here, no matter if I cut it into 10,000 pieces, each piece is going to have a pretty similar angle. None of them are going to be close to zero. So if I cut it in 10,000 pieces, they're all going to, they're all going to have a similar slant right here. None of them are going to be close to horizontal. So we do have to account for that fact. So the way we're going to account for that is we're not we're going to measure our height in a slightly weird way before we took our height basically to be the width of the cylinder or dx what we're going to do now is use that measurement as the height so that's going to be where our height comes from that slanted measurement that one's not going to be flat so i can't just go with dx for that So I'm going to call this, actually let's call that, I think the book uses L, so we'll go with L for that. What other measurement do I need to get the area? I need some type, so this is sort of like the width, but I need some type of radius measurement, right? And if if this is very thin, it doesn't matter which of the two that I pick, because they'll be super close. If I pick this left radius or the right radius, if I cut up into lots of little pieces, that won't matter so much. So we'll just go with, we'll go with the one on the left. So this will be our radius right there. So we got a radius and we got a length or a height. So I need the service area of this piece. So this is basically a cylinder. We're measuring the height a little bit weird at this kind of diagonal. So it's going to be a little longer than I would measure it if I was, if I had a cylinder for sure and that L was not slanted, I could just go with the height, that sideways measurement. We're still, when we compute this, we're still going to treat it like a cylinder. So this is going to be the 
height times the base area, or no, not base area, base circumference. That's what I want. So we're going to multiply that value L by the circumference. And circumference will be that red measurement right there. So we're not looking for the area of that. We're looking for basically the circumference. How long around is it? And you can think of we're cutting the label off a can and then opening it up, basically. So that circumference of the can is the measurement we need. How do I get circumference if I know a radius? 2 pi r, that's all we need. So we'll just move our 2 pi out front, 2 pi r l. So there's our area of this piece. Now you have to remember way back to last section, our length comes from a curve f of x. How do I get the length of that line segment? What do I do with f to get the length? So it has square root 1 plus f prime x squared. That was the tricky part of this. So that was from last section. That was our arc length. So for, don't look at the picture, just look at the arc length and what we've done down below that weird curve that I just drew. Do you think we have a dx or a dy integral? Don't look at the picture. I want you to think about squeegeeing regions. We don't have a region. So we got a dx integral. So we set this up for a dx integral. So we need a radius of x function. Now in this example here, our radius, if we trace our radius measurement back, r of x, what does our radius, what is our radius in this particular example? It's our original function, f of x. So generally, r of x will equal f of x unless your rotation axis is not your x-axis. So I'm going to write, rot uh, rotation of x is generally going to be your f of x function plus your rotation offset. So the best way to think about it is just visually your radius just like you did before to get your, uh, actually either method, but this is more similar to the radius in the shell method than it is to the radii in the washer method. So think about it sort of like the radius in the shell method. So you're not exactly making shells, you're making these weird slanted cylinders, and they're hollow, they're not filled in, so there are some differences, but that radius acts just like the radius in the shell method. All right, so that's our area of x function, and all we have to do is integrate from a to b. So our total surface area, we'll use s for this. This is integral a to b, 2 pi is constant, comes out front, r of x square root 1 plus f prime x squared dx.
and this is when you got y as a function of x. If you get the information the other way, x is a function of y. So the other way to write it, 2 pi integral a to b, everything will be a function of y now. And use this one when x is a function of y. If you can do a cylinder, uh, a cylinder volume problem, you can do a service area problem as long as you have the formula. The formula is a little less intuitive. It, this is probably more important to make it on your formula sheet. I'd probably put both on my formula sheet, but this one is a lot less intuitive to reconstruct. Turns out it's just, it's actually a little bit easier to use. We're going to do two examples out of this section. So we are going to find the service area, but before I write down find service area, how do you know this is not a volume problem? I haven't written service area and I haven't written volume down. How do you know that this shape is not going to spin into a volume or spin into a solid shape? What's that? Revolve a curve. So revolve a curve. So if you revolve a region, a two-dimensional object, you're going to get a three-dimensional object. Basically when you revolve, you pick up a dimension. So here we're revolving a curve, a one-dimensional object, and we're going to pick up a dimension, so we're going to have a two-dimensional shape. So that's important to know which type you have. So I probably write down find service area versus find volume, but you should be able to know which of the two you're doing before I even say one of those two words. So if you've got a curve you're revolving, you're looking at area. If you've got a uh, region, you're going to look at a volume. So find service area. So what was the first step we did when we revolved our regions? What's that? You, well, we had to graph them first. So let's graph our curve and figure out we're going from what, uh, x1, x equals 1 to x equals 2. So graph your curve out. And then try your best to draw your revolved uh, surface. If you have a curve that curves equal one dimension, when you rotate them, they have a two-dimensional surface area? Yes. So you gain one dimension when you rotate. Uh, well, I mean, you, can, you, can, you could gain up to one dimension when you rotate. You can Does do it. Does that imply you can gain one and a half dimensions? Mm. You said I, don't, I don't know about that, but uh, what I was thinking was uh, if you revolve the x-axis about the x-axis, what do you get? Yeah, exactly. Yep. So if you have an unexciting rotation, i.e. something that is already on the axis itself, you don't get anything interesting. So that, that's what I was referring to. You only, get, you only pick up a dimension if you're off of your rotation axis.
Now, where exactly is 2 square root 2? Above 2. It's probably a little higher up than that, but I'm not too concerned about exactly where, where I have it written. Remember, you don't have to have your graph super accurate, but you do need to have your starting and ending values pretty accurate. All right, so we got our picture. Now we'll rotate this about x-axis, hopefully. Oh, about y-axis. That definitely changes things. So you rotate about the wrong axis, you're not going to find the, the right uh, surface area. So we're going to rotate about the y-axis. So our shape will look something like this. So I'm going to pick a little cross-section and try to draw it in blue. My curve's kind of short. So my cross section looks pretty, takes up a third of the curve. So I'm going to redraw what my cross section looks like here. So the reason I'm doing this is so I can measure the length and the radius easily. So you have to know what, I don't, for example, I don't want to measure the radius to the x-axis. That's why I'm doing this. That would be a really bad way to measure this thing. So don't want to measure the x-axis. We're not rotating about the x-axis, so that has nothing to do with the radius. So our radius is measured to the y-axis. And our length is this measurement right there. That's L. So any questions on the radius measurement and the L measurement? Where's our idea of y? We'll get there. Okay. Oh, there's one thing I didn't write on the service area formulas. The first one we rotated about the x-axis. <coughs> and the second one was rotate about the y-axis. So because we're rotating about the y-axis, we were pretty much stuck with the second version. So we have to use the second one, and so these are going to be dy integrals for that reason. So we're going to use number two here because we have a y-axis rotation. So I need an r of y function, and I also need to figure out what is g of y. So I need to solve the original um, y equals square, 2 square root x. I need to solve that for x. So let's do the easy one first, r of y. Actually, that's not easy. Let's do g of y. So what is g of y? It's basically uh, the inverse of our original. So let's go ahead and do that. So we need to. y equals 2 square root x, and invert this. So divide by 2, and square both sides. So x equals y squared over 4. This is g of y. So we took the original function and inverted it, and that's our g of y function. So what is r of y now? The <coughs> y-axis. So 
y-axis is small, so let's write big minus small. And remember, we need functions of y here. So what is the big? The two square root two. Almost, except we need to have it solve for x. So I need a function of y, so I have to solve for x. So it is the same curve, it's just the equation solved for the other variable. So the big is y squared over 4. Actually, let's write this out in English first. So I'm going to go curve minus y-axis, which our curve is the y squared over 4. Y-axis is x value of 0. So we're going curve minus y-axis. And everything's functions of y. So we got r of y, we got g of y. Now we have to find g prime of y and then plug it in. So from here it's really just computations. So we're done with worrying about geometry pretty much. It's just up here calculus algebra problem after this. So I'm just looking up here. I need to find 1 plus g prime squared and then simplify that. So r, and r of y and g of y are equal? Yeah, they will be equal when, somewhere up here I wrote that down, your radius is your original function plus an offset is usually how it's going to work. And this one's offset is zero because we're doing it from the axis. Yeah. Thank you. And, that's, and I can't emphasize enough how important your picture is to your measurements of your radius. And it works, the picture works just like it did for everything else in chapter six, all your other rotations. All right, so g prime of y. Let's take this derivative. We get y over two. So we have one plus g prime y squared. One plus y over two squared, or one plus y squared over two squared, and we're ready to plug into the integral. And we're plugging into the second integral, two pi a to b, r of y square root of one plus g prime y squared dy. So our r of y is y squared over 4, or y squared over 2 squared, square root 1 plus y squared over 2 squared dy. And endpoints. Are my endpoints x values or y values? Y. y values. What y values do I use for a and b? Two and two square root two. Yeah, the only two that are up there. So just make sure you're picking y's, not x's. So don't go one and two. Go two and two square root two. Lots of twos. Yeah, and you would use that if you're rotating about the x-axis. So in this one, you don't, you don't have a choice like you do. Like you can go washers or shells and then kind of have a dx or a dy depending on which one you pick with volumes. You don't have that choice here. Your things are, are a lot more locked down. Okay. So in some sense, they're almost easier once you figure out the correct measurements. There's not a choice. How do I integrate this? I could try u sub, and if I do that, I'll have an extra y hanging around, though, because my derivative y squared will basically be 2y, and I see another, uh, I see two places that u would appear, but I won't have really a good du. What's another good choice? Well, it may not be pretty. Look inside the square root, that's the big problem. Trig 
trig sub with tangent. So if you leave it the form that it's in, right here you can write tan let tan theta equal y over 2. Because well, if I rewrite this, this is y over 2 whole thing squared. So in this form, you would say tangent is this y over 2. Or you could, uh, let's see, multiply a 2 inside. And then you can change it around. So it would be 2 squared plus y squared if you want. So there's tangent. Take derivative of this whole thing. So derivative tangent secant squared theta d theta equals 1 half dy. So you're still going to have something tricky. I think it's a secant cubed. When you finally do all your subs, you'll get a, uh, oh, it'll be a tangent squared secant cubed is what you'll get. Because you get an extra out hanging out over here is going to be tangent squared. So you get an extra tangent squared that goes in. And then you'll get a secant squared off swapping out your derivative, and then this turns into a regular um, secant. But I don't want to take away any of the fun of solving the integral. So that's not really part of this chapter. So this is an integral I expect you to be able to solve. That's just the first step. So we have time for one more example, which is exactly how many I have left. Sorry about writing way over there. So we'll start our next example here. How do we know this is not a volume? That this is going to be an area? Segment. So we got a segment. So a segment is basically a straight curve. So we're still rotating a curve, it's just a straight line segment curve now. So find service area. So you have to be careful. There's the curve. The inequality is the restriction on y values. So it's not the entire line segment, it's just these y values. And then we're not rotating about an axis, we're rotating about a line. So go ahead and graph out the line segment, restricted y values, and how we're going to rotate. And then draw your little tiny segment as it rotates. So if you drew out your line, the whole line, you drew way too much. So we've got to cut off a lot of this. We're just going 
y value 0 to 1. So we got some erasing. So I wrote out my revolved So I wrote out my revolved segment and the radius so I can see the length and the radius. So do I need a function of x or y? So if we look back, we're not revolving about the x-axis or the y-axis. However, we're almost revolving about the y-axis. So we're revolving about a vertical line. So we're going with number two here. So we're not quite going around the y-axis, but right next to the y-axis. So we're going with number two. So we're using the second one. So I need functions of y. Number two is a dy integral, so I need an r of y, and we'll get that first. So what is, so big is going to be here the curve, and small is the rotation axis. Not the y-axis, but the rotation axis. So our curve is already written as a function of y. So I don't have to do any more work. Our curves are already set up. So our curve is x equals 1 minus y. So we're just using that 1 minus y. What is the small value? What is the small value? Negative 1. Negative 1. So I got a minus a negative 1. So 1 minus y plus 1, so we get 2 minus y. So whatever your y value is, is 2 minus that is your radius. Oh, and it's time to go. So we'll get the length next. 